Hello, humans, Bigfoots, and other creatures of the forest. This is Josh Schlosper with the Green Root Podcast. For this episode, we'll be speaking with Craig Patterson. From trees to milling and finished products, Craig has attempted to articulate a sustainable vision of forestry around true selective harvesting, local portable mill processing, and end finished product forest management. Less is more, and basic conservation is the foundation of Craig's work. Welcome to the podcast, Craig. Thank you, Josh. It's good to be here. Yeah, really glad you're here. I met Craig, I don't know, 15 years ago, I don't even know anymore, in Oregon where I used to live where I was doing forest advocacy work. And Craig had been talking for a long time about, well, sure, of course we need to protect forests, but sometimes we're going to need to cut some trees, which I think is undeniably obvious. So the question is how to do that in the best way prop possible. So let's talk a little about that. So most of the discussion, of course, in the environmental world is when not to cut trees. And I think that's super, super important. But at the same time, I don't think we're going to be living in a world without wood. And so what's the best way to go about this? So, so you're not advocating for massive clear cutting and herbicide spraying, I assume. No, quite the contrary. But, but Josh, I think it's important to begin with context yeah. and to understand where we have come from. I worked in a lumber mill with my grandfather 53 years ago in Redding, California. And back then there were jobs everywhere. Um, the, the economy was booming. A, a man's wage was $2.89 an hour, and that could support a family and have a boat on Lake Shasta. And, but it wasn't sustainable. And the way we treated our forests is the same way we treated the buffalo when we killed it for its tongue. We have, we have decimated the forest. But there are other approaches like Dick Smith or Orville Camp or Merv Wilkinson or the Menominee or many other true people who lived within the bounds of what nature will will give and will bear and that is the sustainable path so it's to me the focus in industrial forestry which has been around and and roosevelt and pinchot warned us against back in the formation of the forest service in 1909 that they have been in control and power and have undermined the long-term sustainability of the of the intact basic forest. Mm -hmm. For sure. So, yeah, it's clear that you're somebody who does understand the importance of protecting forest ecosystems a fair amount. I wouldn't even say most, who knows, but obviously a lot of folks who are interested in the logging world it's kind of a secondary concern for them. It's not like they all hate the forest or anything like that, but it's certainly, they're not coming from an ecological point of view. So that's what I've always appreciated about, about your work and the work of some of the other folks you mentioned, Orville Camp with his Ecostry and Roy Keane, also another eco-forester type. So I, th I think it's really important and I think it's, I think it's not talked about enough and I'm probably even guilty of that as a wilderness guy. I'm, I'm always talking about one end of the equation and not the other, but I am more interested in, okay, what does it actually look like to, to do things right? So, so what has been your specific experience in the woods in terms of taking out trees? Like how does that look different from what the industrial foresters are doing? Well, in the, in the late 1970s, we had a co-op in the McKinsey, the McKinsey River Co-op, it was called, although we had to change the name because there was a conflict with the high school. But um, it was a labor-intensive co-op that did all kinds of work other than tree planting, pretty much. And we had a contract to remove a old-growth danger tree, dead danger tree, 
um, in the French Peak campground parking lot. And it was a mill on site operation. So we brought a mobile dimension mill in and milled, fell the tree and milled it up on site. And that was my um, beginning into understanding the difference between a, an industrial mill or a resaw mill that I grew up with my grandfather and a portable mill where you bring the mill to the tree. Okay. So what what is actually different in terms of the impact in doing that? So you don't have to truck the tree, obviously, to the mill. So that's a major a major thing. What what else is different about that? Everything is different. For one, it gets the scale right. When the industrial model is so fraught with waste, it's off the charts. One study I saw that was done in, I think, 65, said that the equivalent residue left over from logging in one year in California, Oregon, and Washington was the equivalent of more than 7 million cords of wood. And it got worse every year until 1990 when the, the feds stopped the cut, finally. So... And that, and plus, in the 80s here in Oregon, one third of the forest fires were slopovers from burning units. So the waste is off the charts for the industrial paradigm. Um, and that's only a, a, one aspect of how it is unsustainable. Whereas dealing with a single tree, you utilize it. I mean, we. This is an old growth. We, as I recall, we even used the branches for firewood, because it had value. You know, an old growth branch gives a has a lot of BTUs, infinitely more than any pecker pole does. Sure. So these mills, these portable mills. So what do they look like? They they've come a long ways. Um, you know, initially the old mobile dimension mill was Volkswagen powered and it was on a track and it had a main blade and two edger blades that all ran off the same motor and you would line it up over the, over the log. And we're talking big logs here, obviously. Um, and you would just run it down the log and mill it and then br bring it back and move it over and mill the next next board so that was the technology then um the technology has then come to what they call a swing arm blade which is was originated by peterson i believe it was in new zealand but lucas in uh, australia has really taken it the farthest most successfully but it's a where the the blade rotates 90 degrees, so again, you set the, the frame over the log, and you can quarter saw the log without moving the log, the way you dial it in, so you can get by far the best structural or otherwise return on your milling as you read the log and, and unfold it. But now there's also a lot of band mills, which in some ways are far better because the band mill has a very small saw kerf. And also it enables you to be able to do natural edge with, with smaller wood, of course. But um, I've, I've taken, you know, maple and alder and, and hardwoods and taken natural edge slivers, you know, three eighths of an inch thick, for example and made Adirondack chairs and then supported it where it needs, you know, support. But, you know, in other words, you're no longer even just confined to traditional dimensions and you can be creative and innovative relative to strength to weight ratios and, and joinery and, and other aspects that you can bring to bear. Sure. But it, but it's slow and it's methodical, and it's not wasting, mm -hmm. and it's focusing on 
long-term job creation and the health and well-being of the forest. Well, that's an interesting point that you bring up because a lot of the timber industry, the logging industry has accused environmentalists of destroying careers for loggers and millers and stuff like that. And while it may be slightly true that environmentalists have gotten some protections that have slowed down some production, the reality is it was just unsustainable to begin with. It was boom and bust. A lot of these places went out of business before environmentalists, I wouldn't say existed, but were really doing much to push back. So more or less, it was just that they overcut the land base and that was inevitable. But if we're talking about jobs, really, it seems as if industrial forestry is against jobs and they, they automate everything and they have this process that it, it limits the amount of jobs because it's, um, well, they make it less labor intensive and that means less jobs. So would a different way of doing forestry actually provide more jobs for folks in the woods? Well, totally, a absolutely. And when you look at, when you look at the history, you know, for example, in Lane County, 35, 40 years ago, 71% of the employment base was wood products, forestry, construction. To the, today, it's 3 to 5%, I believe. And that, you know, the jobs, when I think about working at D Lumber Company with my grandfather in 1967, and how there was probably, this was a small resaw mill, and there was probably 120 employees, um, and it was a small one, and they were everywhere. Um, and then you go to Seneca, or you go to the Gilchrist Mill, and you see one guy in a crow's nest with joysticks and cameras operating the majority of the mill. There is, there is nothing sustainable about the industrial model, not economically, not socially, and certainly not environmentally. Yep. Yep. I would definitely agree with that. So one point of contention we probably have is, as you know, I'm a public lands guy, and I think we should basically turn all public lands into, into wilderness. You might say, well, we can do some selective logging. Let, let's just say we, if we disagree on the the public lands aspect, I think we would agree that a selective forestry in certain areas, in my mind, that would be more private lands, is the way to go. So what does that actually look like in the woods? So we know what a clear cut looks like, right? You say, oh, here are some trees, now they're all gone. And there are other versions of basically clear cuts where they leave a couple trees here and there or whatever. So what would, what would look different about selective forestry in the woods? Well, I, I think that, that the, the solution that, that is so desperately needed is the solution we did 90 years ago when, we, when they brought us out of the Depression with the CCC camps. And that what we need to do is have many decentralized, appropriate scale CCC camps in the forest, in the woods, and um, and having you know having jobs and houses for them, or dormitories, or barracks, or private rooms in a building, or what have you, and then also be able to utilize some of the dead, the down, the disease, the hazard trees improving the health and well-being of the forest as you go, but also doing restoration that desperately needs to be done that I believe currently is about 180 degrees going in the wrong direction. Sure. Well, let's talk about the restoration in one second. Just for folks who sure. don't know what the CCC is, that's I just pulled it up on trusty Wikipedia, <laughs> Civilian Conservation Corps. So that's a voluntary public work relief program operated from 1933 to 1942 in the U.S., specifically for unemployed, unmarried men, but obviously that, that could change. And they also had programs for veterans and Native Americans. So basically you're talking about bringing back a version of that, pe getting people to do things in the woods that you think are worthwhile, and it gives people jobs and gives people something to do and probably a connection to the land that a lot of younger folks don't have currently, right? 
Absolutely. Uh, but it's but it's also about, you know, giving people a place to live and a job. Sure. One or the other is not sufficient. I hear people, that. People and it's, it's also oh. a developmental thing. So I'll say really quickly, my I have a young cousin and she was kind of a wild girl. And then basically they sent her to all sorts of places to deal with that. But the thing that really ended up working was she did do, I, I can't remember what it was called, if it was a version of, it wasn't CCC, but something where she's in the woods building trails and things like that. And then she also did some firefighting and basically that turned her into a woman. That turned her into a full adult. She went past that impulsive kind of egocentric stage into a stage where she had some rules and some boundaries and then also this bigger connection to other people, right, and responsibilities, but also to the natural world. So I witnessed that firsthand just on a whole different level of just basically psychological development. So I just wanted to put that in there real quick. Absolutely. No, I, I think it's it's critically important and it's something that we're that we've we're missing in our society, you know, that they used to do vision quests at 12 or 13 or 14, where people would would spend time in silence on their own. And and we have have lost that um, that ability to even understand the wisdom that can grow out of that awareness. Absolutely. And a lot of folks have actually been talking about this idea of a gap year, basically and whether it should be required or not might be a debate, but a year of public service that all people, all U.S. citizens do at, at a certain age. So it sort of does help them grow up and it basically makes them a little bit more invested in doing positive things in the country. So that can be a win, win, win. So let's say they're out there doing some restoration. So what do you mean by by restoration? Keeping in mind, of course, that the timber industry calls everything <laughs> these days restoration, much of which is really kind of the opposite. So how would you distinguish genuine restoration from restoration in quotation marks? Well, I think the first step of restoration has got to be understanding the depths of the cause and effects that cause the re need for restoration in the first place. If we don't do that, then we're pissing in the wind, <laughs> essentially. And, you know, in they've been doing restoration here on the McKinsey now for, I don't know, 20 years or so. And I have yet, I've asked the, uh, the Watershed Council and the, and the um, McKinsey Trust and, local, and the scientists at the Andrews and at OSU and other places, where is a prioritization of threats relative to the McKinsey ecosystem. It's non-existent. It's non-existent. And, and so now, there, the pro, one of the projects that they're working on on the South Fork, um, below the Cougar Dam, and they've spent, I think, like $3 million so far, and they're just in phase two and there's four phases and um, with big equipment and putting trees in, in the confluence of the South Fork and the McKinsey. But in their own paperwork, they talk about that they reject Blue River because there's a dam there. Not realizing Cougar is two miles upstream from the South Fork. <laughs> and and what's more, it's like the um, Quartz Creek, which is the, the valley to the west um, of the South Fork and, and all. Quartz Creek was completely uh, destroyed by Roseboro Lumber Company, in, mostly in the 80s, um, some in the 70s, started in, in the 70s, it seems. And, and they've cut everything. There were... 564, I think, designations at the Department of Forestry of high-risk areas, high-risk sites, and northern spotted owl sites that meant nothing to the operator. Nothing. There was no follow-up. There was, there was nothing. 
And then in um, 96, when we had the two flood events in February and in November, on February 6th of 96, the intake at EWEB was 2,200 NTU units. So just say what EWEB is. EWEB is the Eugene Water and Electric Board, which delivers water for, for, for most of Eugene. Yep. Great. And NTU units is a, a measure of uh, solids and erosion in, in the water. On that day, at, at the intake, it was 2,200. The threshold for fil- clean water is between 5 and 10. And the majority of that was coming out of Quartz Creek. And yet, you know, nothing is really done with Quartz Creek in part because it's a private landowner. Right. So these areas were cut over. And what you're saying is that because of that, there has been a lot of ongoing soil erosion that gets into the watershed. It's been off the charts. Yeah. You know, the, the spikes are, the, those spikes have been off the charts. Um, and, you know, it's steep ground. Whether anything will ever come back there or not is, is hard to say. But, you know, the problem, I think, really comes down to this, Josh. And that is that we excel at privatizing profits and socializing liabilities. And that is totally an unsustainable approach. You know, if the, if the liabilities are not held accountable and are not even understood in the, relative to the causes that cause them in the first place, we can't possibly solve these problems. Agreed. And I think that's a really, really crucial point that is left out of the equation almost all of the time. So these areas, these areas have been degraded, some say destroyed by years of industrial logging operations. So what would you say to those of us, the, the wide-eyed radicals such as me that are saying, yeah, for sure, that's why we need to leave it alone completely and let it recover? What would you say to, say to that? Well... I, I, you know, the, the problem is that we need and we use wood products. Do we do it very smart? Absolutely not. Do we waste more than we probably utilize? Absolutely. Um, do we need to change the way we're doing it? There's no doubt about it, either voluntarily or involuntarily. But... Um, and a lot of places do need to recover. And I think that the whole notion of restoration by human hand is a complete and utter fallacy. Nature restores, not us. We screw it up. And then we don't have the smarts to understand the reasons why we screwed it up so that we continue to screw it up while we're restoring it. <laughs> you know, the absurdities are totally off the charts. Um, as well as the well intentions being misplaced. And, and this is a function of many things, including groupthink, which has undermined higher education in spades. Yeah. 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 Groupthink has undermined a lot of things, and there's different kinds of groupthink. But yeah, I agree. Often it is uncritical, and that is not a good way of looking at things. So, so when we say that these areas have been degraded, so let's say, let's say this is just a, a private forest then, so it doesn't conflict with my ideology of, of public land should be left alone. So let's just say that we have an area that one of the big companies has cut over, they clear cut it, right? And then, so for the most part, it's, it's going to be growing back with a single tree species, right? So probably dug fir, it's going to be a bit of a thicket of young trees that are closely grown that don't really necessarily resemble natural stands, although there's some debate about that. So plantation forests, right? So that's what we're talking about a lot of times, tree farms. Sure. So we have a tree farm and of course those areas burn hotter 
in terms of wildfires because they're all the same age and it's just in some ways a tinder box as opposed to larger stands that have all sorts of different age classes. They are not biodiverse, all, all sorts of issues with them. And there's nothing really growing on the forest floor, all that sort of stuff. So what would be done in one of those tree farms that would you say that would actually improve the, the landscape ecologically while at the same time, perhaps getting some forest products? Well, I think I would start by passing a bill that said that the person who perpetuated this is going to pay through the nose for the next four generations and support um, restoration efforts and that all of their profits be put in escrow um, for this um, endeavor because as long as we separate the rape from the rapist, um, we can't solve the problem. So, you know, there's got to be consequences for, for the bad, the, the stupid behavior. But beyond that, I think that it is prob it's highly problematic of doing anything because like you say, and I've brought this up myself that not only CM Countryman did a, a bunch of research on, on fire, um, back in the sixties. And he, he did one very important paper called changing the old, old growth, converting old growth also converts the fire scape. And he showed where in a clear cut at two, it was 66 degrees warmer than on the ground or in the canopy of the forest next door. And, but it's not just that, it's also the increased fuel load that we talked about. And it's also the wind and how, you know, if the, if there is a forest, the wind's over the top of it, but if there's a clear cut, the wind and the wind is what creates the cataclysmic um, conditions as well for drying things out. And so plantations are cataclysmic fires waiting to happen. I've tried to ask the researchers, have they studied how much separation would it, would there be need to be between the forest floor and the lower branches for the possibility of a beneficial surface fire? And they say, good question, Craig, but we haven't asked it. So, you know, it's, and then plus the notion of trying to grow trees faster is complete, completely and the antithesis of quality and value. Huh. Well, that's a really important point. And I, I don't really know a ton about the details, but all I do, all I do know is that it seems like a lot of the times where they want to quote, restore for us, and this can even be some more legitimate restoration, it seems. The idea is specifically to prevent competition from other trees for sunlight, so opening it up so the trees can grow faster. So that seems to be the whole, the whole premise. So what's wrong with growing your tree faster? Your structural integrity is a function of your growth rings. And the, the tighter the growth rings, the, tri, the tighter the structural integrity. And this is borne out in the engineering of, of wood, the F sub B and the modulus of elasticity and the modulus of, of breaking. And that the more pith that you have in the wood, the less structural integrity you have. And it's I think that it's endemic to the point, and I've tried to bring this up because at Oregon State, they are building a new forestry headquarters out of the CLTs, the cross laminated timbers. Have you heard about that? Well, $80 million for 80,000 square feet and a small auxiliary building, and they had panels fall out they had to replace 80 panels and 
I think that it's going to be something that is never going to work because what they're essentially doing is taking these young trees, you know, 30 to 60 years old, I guess, and making two by fours or two by sixes and then cross laminating them like plywood. The problem is, and I've tried to bring this up even to the engineers in Madison, Wisconsin, I believe the problem is, is that that wood has more pith than it has growth rings. And the pith will allow the transference of moisture, which is the reason why these CLTs is failing. So if you understand structural integrity, if you understand, you know, the, the physics of wood, the faster that you grow it becomes really only valuable for chips, for, for paper, or for biomass, which is both terminally stupid. Mm -hmm. So these trees that are growing too fast, they're less structurally sound. I think that's not something a lot of people really have heard of. So wouldn't that, though, be an argument to just let these spinely plantation tree farms just kind of continue to grow on their own rather than do anything? Wouldn't that actually encourage tighter ring growth to just let them compete for the sunlight on their own? I, I think personally that um, if, if I was in charge of, of, of doing something like this, I think the, the first thing I would do is, is get rid of the chemicals and protect the soil and make sure and rebuild the soil as much as possible. I would also thin, thin them out. I would also thin the lower branches and, and you know, and then take that material and, and burn it in small piles so that you could potentially bring back the possibility of the surface fire. And I would also, though, plant um, or encourage different species. But the reality is, if we do forestry right, we don't need to replant at all. And then nature, all of nature's benefits perpetuate for free, and we don't need to restore anything. Yeah, if you keep the soil intact and you don't open it up into a wasteland, trees grow back. And frankly, even in some of those, quote, wastelands, the trees grow back. In the big fires, I walked around the Biscuit Fire is down in southern Oregon and several other areas, which were really big, hot fires, trees do come back. They're, they come back on their own. If, if we leave nature alone in that regard, it'll come back. But so when you're talking about thinning trees out, because here's, here's the thing, even folks I know who are radical wilderness folks, they would acknowledge that a lot of these tree farms are not ecologically sound and could maybe benefit from in their mind, maybe a, a hand thinning or something like that, whether that's feasible or not, but they just don't trust the industries to do it. So I don't think the issue is, as much is really whether those stands, those tree farms could benefit from a sort of thinning. It's just that a lot of us don't really trust the entities to do it. But let's say they were doing it. So you mentioned thinning the trees out. What, is that, what does that look like in terms of thinning the trees out? Josh, I think this is a key question, and I think that for the most part, this is where people in restoration get it wrong, and that is machine, using machines creates more problems than it solves, and it, it creates compaction, it creates invasives, it disrupts what's there. It undermines jobs in spades. The, you know, as an example, the Oregon Watershed Enhancement Board, OWEB, has been in existence for 20 years. They've spent $566 million for putting logs in streams. What do they have to show for it? And when I've tried to ask them, where is their separation between jobs created and big equipment or high tech utilized, they can't even address it. So if we take the path of, of the big machinery 
then we undermine everything else. If we take the path of, you know, giving people a potential path forward and, you know, the idea of, of, of service, I think, would be great. I would like to see personally that that as part of the payment for for service and education that would be relevant as well, that a small house would be part of of the payment at the end of the of the stint, you know, to give people really a sense of hope about their future, which has been undermined so much today. And it, if we don't, if we don't have, if people don't have that path, is like Dylan said, if you ain't got nothing, you know, you got nothing to protect. Yep. You got nothing, nothing to lose. Right. If you ain't got nothing, you got nothing to lose. Right. Yep. Yeah. So, so in terms of thinning out the forest specifically, so without machinery, so you don't mean without chainsaws, you mean without big buncher fellers, feller buncher machines, like the monster caterpillars coming in, right? Precisely. But I think that also that we, we need to develop more intermediate technology that can be human powered, um, you know, that, that can, you know, do things like maybe if, if you had a, a log that you, you know, was too far away, that was, was usable, that you wanted to use, but you needed to bring it somewhere to mill it, you know, to, to do a low tech zigzag, you know, system to, to move the log, um, you know, to where you could mill it, um, you know, but intermediate technology that's human scaled, not industrial scaled. Yep. Yeah, there was a guy that I knew back in Vermont where I was living there and I was part of the town forest commission or something like that. And it was just this little patch of forest. And he was an old school, basically eco forester. And he talked about these <clears throat> these little machines from, I don't know if it was from Sweden, somewhere in Scandinavia. And they were these little machines, I guess, that you rode in on. So that might be even bigger than you're talking about. I'm not sure. And I don't remember what they're called. And I did no research. But there were these smaller things that could sort of weave between the trees and the they were lighter. So they didn't have that compaction of the soil and they didn't require all these massive roads, roads of which are arguably the most damaging thing in the forest as opposed to just cutting the trees because they're just threaded through. And then they're it's what they think. uh I don't know if it's hundreds of thousands of miles of roads in our public forests and then all the erosion and all of the uh, issues around that. So is that kind of what you're talking about? Some of those smaller scale machines? Absolutely. And, and you're exactly right about the roads. You know, the, the side cast roads pre 76 were the worst offenders by far, but fortunately they finally learned about that. But um, no, most most erosion absolutely is is the effect of road building, and the soil is the primary resource in the landscape, not the trees. Yeah. Once the soil goes, the trees don't come back. Period. And I I find it interesting. Did you ever, when you were in Oregon, ever go to the Andrews Experimental Forest? Yes, yes, several times. Do you remember looking at those first three units that they logged back in the fifties? I don't remember details now. Yeah. They still haven't come back. Oh, really? Okay. <laughs> you know, it's like, um, you know, it's, it's amazing how industrial forestry for so many is like my stepfather used to say, they have, they have a mouthful of shit and they can't say shit. You know, yeah. it's, it's like, Excuse my French, but no, that's fine. That's <laughs> accurate. But it's just, you know, where is and and I've been trying to ask where's the social relevance of the science. Um, and when you look, I, I get science stuff all the time from P and W and other places, and have for thirty five or forty years now. And if you ask the question, what is the social relevance of this? question rarely does it make sense and and meanwhile everything 
is going to hell in the handbasket and we can't even envision real solutions, nor can we even discuss them. And that's that's the real frustrating part for me. Um, you know, I gave a paper in D.C. for the National Roundtable on Sustainable Forests in 2005. And at that time, there were seven papers given. And at that time, the majority of authors all talked about that the target has to be the simultaneous integration of environmental health, economic vitality, and social equality. And then they never gave it any airtime after that. You know? Yeah. So the folks who would be doing this, because I know I've been guilty in the past and probably present and likely into the future of focusing a lot more on the ecosystems than the humans. I do think that the bottom line is ecosystems, but if we ignore the human equation, not only are we not actually going to be protecting the ecosystems, but we're allowing for a lot of suffering and we're not really living in reality. So I long ago, long, long ago, didn't stop hating folks who were loggers and stuff like that. There was a period when I did partially with, I was doing tree sitting and they literally shot at us. So, so that was a little bit of trauma there, but I got over that and realized, Hey, these are actually folks who grow up in a particular area. First of all, they don't necessarily have a lot of other economic opportunities. So you take the opportunities that are in your area. They often come from families where that has been the job that's been done for years. And it's a, it's dangerous as hell. It's not like it's some cushy job. It is hard ass work. I believe it is the most dangerous job in America. I recently looked that up. It, it could be different, but super dangerous job. So understanding where these folks are coming from. And I think the contention that, so I'm talking right now, even not about the eco foresters. I'm talking about the guys who work for Roseburg Lumber, who work for these big companies and Maybe let's leave the big timber barons out of it. But the guys who are working for these companies, I, they almost all live in the forest. So the idea that they hate the forest is just not true. In fact, they probably I would I'm making this up, but I'm sure it's true. I'm sure most loggers live closer to the forest than most environmentalists do. Right. They're living out there in the woods. They don't hate the woods. They have a different version and a different view of it. So if our idea is, well, we want to turn you into a hippie environmentalist, not going to happen, right? That's not their background. That they, they have no interest in that. But there might be a different option if we meet them halfway in terms of, listen, surely you've seen the cutover areas. Surely you've seen the erosion. You, you know what's going on a little bit. But at the same time, you don't really believe that there shouldn't be any work done in the woods. So here is a way to start giving folks a better option that actually provides them with more jobs. And like you said, gives them hope. And I, I like that idea of being able to provide homes for people, things like that. So, so do you think that the, do you think that the folks who are currently working for unsustainable companies might have an incentive to be a part of this? I wish. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I wish. Um, I, unfortunately not. Unfortunately, they seem to think that, that I'm the enemy and that, um, I, you know, I, I, um, yeah, no, it's, it is, what I'm saying is totally contrary to, to their way of doing business, but at the same time, um, you know, the problems have become so deep and so dysfunctional. Um, I mean, my vision would be if you, if you put Lane County and Douglas County, the, the two counties, you know, in the center of the western part of the state, in context, more timber was cut out of those two counties for 40 years, between 50 and 1990, than any other state in the, in the Union other than Oregon and Washington. We, this is the heart of the most productive softwood forest in the world. And yet, there are no thriving rural forested communities anywhere in the country, according to Mary Mitsos of the National Forest Foundation, in communication with me. So 
what is wrong with this picture? Why is it that 4J school districts, you know, which I think has six or seven high schools, two of them have shop classes? Why is it that two high schools that I know of, one in um, Sweet Home and one in, I think, it's Sutherland, have mills associated with small mills, small portable band mills associated with their um, shop curriculum. Why isn't that everywhere? You know, why, why have we gotten to the point where, you know, with our grandparents, there was a good chance that our, our grandfather learned the same skills that his father did. We've lost that. And, and our economics has enabled us to, to separate and, and not have that same sense of continuity, you know, with work and livelihood. And I think that it's going to come back for a number of reasons, not the least of which is that finding a sense of place and being there is going to be increasingly important. Yeah. Now, that's a really excellent point. And so, yeah, maybe you're right. It's kind of too late for people who are unlikely to turn over a new leaf, so to speak. But the younger kids, particularly in these areas, you're saying can sort of introduce them into a softer version of the industrial forestry that's been going on in the area. A lot of I mean, there's a very small percentage of those kids who would be getting into there's not enough jobs necessarily for them to be working for these big companies anyway anymore. So it's not like that's a super lucrative life option. But if there were a more, a softer touch, you're saying that that could be an easy way to start getting kids interested in this. And like you said, connecting to the place, because I do think that is the one thing that even though, even though a lot of the folks, like I said, who live out there are part of the destruction of the area, they do have a connection to it and maybe it's a dysfunctional unhealthy connection to it but that can be fostered and this might be one way to do it is what you're saying well and and also i think that if you know what we need is that sense of a path forward and and learning basic su survival skills is part of that path and that that um younger people, if we can bring back the CCC camps that did phenomenal work here, you know, they built D Wright observatory and the Mount hood ski lodge. And, and, uh, you know, I don't know all of what they did, but it was massive. And, and in many, many places, plus they gave people a renewed sense of hope and opportunity about their future that brought us out of the depression. And, and that is needed more than ever now. So, you know, my hope with the old loggers, if they'll communicate with me, um, I, I'm, I, I communicate with them whenever possible. But um, I think that, you know, trying to create that better mousetrap and showing how it can have opportunity, you know, to their future generations, maybe not to them, but to their future generations, Maybe eventually they'll come around. Who knows? Yeah, I don't think we can just leave these folks out of the equation. And I do think that is a, a downfall of some aspects of environmentalism where we just pretend the folks who are out there may be doing some harmful things. We can acknowledge that those are harmful things. We've got to put them into the equation somehow. So there's that whole meme years ago back east where coal miners getting losing their jobs, which sorry, but it is a, a bit of a backwards thing to be dependent on coal. But then there is the argument, learn to code is what they tell them. Just learn to code. And it's like, yeah, right. So some lifelong miner, he's in his late fifties, he's just gonna all of a sudden be able to be a computer whiz. That's just really condescending and very unkind. So keeping folks in their realm to a certain degree is an important thing and, and a CCC or whatever that would look like, it wouldn't necessarily just be cutting trees, be like you said, building structures, it could be restoring stream beds, trail work, ripping out roads, man. There's, there's enough roads in national forests to 
return to nature that I think that would probably provide jobs for the next hundred years. We got, I think it's literally hundreds of thousands of miles. I remember some quote about the roads, the logging roads we have in national forests could go stretch to the moon and back or something like that. And I, I can't verify that, but it's probably. No, true. I've heard, I've heard that as well. Yeah. So, yeah, so there's no. lots of stuff for people to do that is beneficial. It, it seems like, it seems like a no brainer. So who, who are some of the politicians who might be open to this? So we have Senator Wyden, who I haven't looked into it much, but has a new bill basically to expand logging, which is his favorite thing to do. And he loves biomass. He loves pretending stuff about wildfires, that if we go and log in backcountry forests, it protects homes from wildfires, which is basically the opposite of true. So I don't think Wyden, Senator Wyden, there's a snowball chance in hell that he'll support anything that isn't just choppity chop, but I could be wrong. But who, who are some politicians on the local or state or national level who might be interested in this? <laughs> That's a good question. <laughs> Unfortunately, um, I, I, I am in, in conversation with June of Wyden's office, oh, but she still she, works there. Wow. That's, she's been there a long time. Yeah, yeah she does. And, and all, but you're right. He he, and and even Merkley, you know, um, has not been good about trying to embrace the kind of things that I'm talking about. Um, I have been in conversation with the new dean of the School of Forestry at OSU, um, and he, in his last email to me, said that he was going to get back to me the latter part of this month, which this coming week is the last, so we'll see. But, um, and he, he came from the University of Montana and was a soil scientist, which gave me some, some hope. Um, and we've had some interesting exchanges. Um, but, you know, the, the question is, though, is that um, so many of these people just don't have the breadth um, and depth that I try to bring to the table. And so I'm bringing up things that they're uncomfortable with trying to respond to. Um, and so they would rather ignore me. And so I get ignored a lot, yep, but join, I join the club. <laughs> I, I know. I mean, it's, it, and it's been, you know, over 40 years going, you know, now, um, yeah, because they don't know how to put you in a box, right? So anytime they can't put you in a box, they don't know what to do with you. So it's like, well, he is a, he's one of the wilderness hippies. Like, well, he's also advocating for some restoration forestry. So he's one of the logger people. Well, not quite. So they don't know what to do with you. Well, and, and also, you know, I've read science research for a long, long time, and I'm well versed in it. And... Um, they don't know how to address that. Well, yeah, you have a knowledge base that far surpasses theirs, of course. I, and I hate to, you know, I, I don't mean to be ego about it, but it's, but it just seems like, you know, their their response to that is, "Go away, kid. We don't like your kind." Yep, that's typically <laughs> that's typically the response. Yeah, it's not even a refuting of your points or putting out other information. It's just a blank stare, and they look away, literally or figuratively. Yeah, well, it might be an opportunity for somebody to run for political office with maybe not that as their whole platform, but as a major platform. That would go over pretty well, I would say, in places like the Pacific Northwest, where there are people who are interested in nature protection, but they also understand that there can be a way of doing some things sustainably, even though that, that sustainable world word is abused. But there's a way, and, and I think... With folks like you and other eco-foresters I trust, I would say I would have no problem supporting moving forward with aspects like that. I'm still a little iffy on the public lands component, but I, I still think there's a lot that could be done. So getting, so, say there's somebody who wants to run for political office on that. Are there environmental groups who are ones with clout, let's just say? Are they interested in these plans at all? Again, I wish, <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, um, I, probably the forest web in Cottage Grove is, is as open as any. Okay. Um, 
but they're not very big. Right, um, right. It's good they're still going, though. I, I remember them. Yeah, Christina. And um, but for the most part, no, it's 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 extremely frustrating again mm. that that, um, you know, and, and they've sold out. They've sold out over biomass a lot. They've sold out over restoration. They've sold out over not connecting the dots with cause and effect. You mean environmental groups in general, not specific? Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. Not not force yeah. web per se. You're, you're talking about environmental groups as a whole in Oregon. Correct. Yep. Correct. Um, and it's, you know, they've, they've become as, I mean, it's just like the thing with, with McKibben. Um, and biomass, you know, um, he supported biomass for 10 years and then he gets religion and, and, and people think, oh, you know, that's okay. You know, no, it's not. Why did it take him 10 years for God's sake? Yeah. Yeah. That's, you a, know, that's a good question. um, come on, this is, you know, biomass. I, I remember learning about energy return on energy investment back in the 70s and biomass makes no sense when you look at it from that perspective yeah from so many perspectives and that one is a pretty basic yeah you, you take that's takes basic. a lot of fossil fuels and and labor and, and machinery to get any energy out of this stuff and at that point you're probably putting in more energy than you're getting out so yeah that sort of solves that <laughs> not a great idea so <laughs> These environmental groups, all right, so politicians, not interested, environmental groups, not interested. How is the media? Is the media covering some of the stuff that you're talking about, at least? Mm. Not much. <laughs> um, not much. And, and that's why I think that, you know, that the key to me and, and what, I'm, what I'm hoping for, and I've, I've reached out to some of the tribes, you know, as well as, as a possibility, but... Um, I think what we need is is just to sh demonstrate a working model, you know, um, and you know, as a pilot, and that's what I've been trying to to suggest, you know, to even places like the Willamette Lane Parks and Recs, you know, department, because they have you know a lot of land, they have trees on occasion, they have need for a labor pool. And why not try to put them together with a, a small CCC camp at some corner of their land somewhere and um, and have a little mill and, and mill up the wood that, that is dead or down. Um, you know, the individual trees and start inventorying, you know, to have that resource and build a shop, um, you know, and, and just utilize what we have that what nature gives and do it in a way that is holistic and as value added in job creating as possible i think that's a brilliant idea and that concept of a model yeah i think that should be employed for everything if we want to see something on a larger scale let's do a little small version of it see how that works show that off expand upon it build upon that kernel i think that's a very doable thing the question is who can you get to be interested in that you fall through the cracks, right? Like I said, there's the wilderness folks like me and we're a little bit, we're a little antsy. Okay. You're advocating for cutting trees. I don't know about that. And I, I've been guilty of that. And I still am very cautious around that, but I do see the need to do legitimate versions of forestry. And I've talked to and walked the lands of enough eco foresters to know that, yeah, there is a way to to do this properly. It's, I still think there needs to be wilderness lands and, and lands set off from that, but it's clear that there are plenty of places we can do that. So the wilderness folks, when they hear you talk, they're not, nah, I don't want to be a part of that. And then the folks who are part of the logging world, you're too much of the, the hippie environmentalist for them. So they don't want to have anything to do with you either. So you're proposing something that I would say is completely legitimate and needs to move forward but the folks who would potentially support you in that world no one really wants to support that because they don't have that that model of complex thinking where you can see okay maybe this piece not this piece maybe this piece and not this piece so 
that's what I'm trying to do a little bit here at Green Root Podcast. I'm still a propagandist for wilderness, but I do see that there are other proposals that make a lot of sense and it should get out there. And yeah, I do think the media, well, the media is, you, you talked about politicians not understanding the issues. Media understands them even even less. There's just not, there's just not much of a grasp of these sorts of things. So my little my little contribution is here. All right, we're doing a podcast about this at least. So some of these ideas can at least be aired and hopefully we can put it out there. But yeah, the fact that this isn't being talked about more, I think is is tragic and I think it makes sense on so many different levels. So hopefully we can keep putting this conversation out there. You've been having this conversation for a long time and I commend you for many reasons not just the fact that it's a good idea, but you're able to go into basically two different lion's dens. So you, you go into the loggers' lion's dens, right? And, and they, don't, they don't like your sustainable ways. And then you go into the wilderness folks' lion's den and they're, they're very suspicious of you as well. But you're able to be in there. You're able to talk with people. You find common ground. You, you stay calm. I think that's a very valuable skill. So I definitely commend you on the work that you've been doing on this for, for decades. Th- thank you. And it's it's also going to the universities and to the scientists, you know, because they're just human beings. And unfortunately, the number of people that I've run across anyway, who are capable of independent thinking yeah. is few and far between. I mean, it's truly it's truly pitiful. Yes. Across to, the board, across the board. You know, Across the board. And, um, you know, this is, I think this is going to be the ultimate, uh, you know, crowning part on our our extinction, you know, is our inability to, to entertain differing hypotheses that can lead to some integration and synthesis. Yep. We've undermined that basic process with groupthink. And it is terminally stupid, I fear. Well, the name of the podcast is the Green Root Podcast because it's about getting the roots of things. And I definitely agree and have been talking for a long time about that being a lot of the roots. So it isn't necessarily even a specific topic. It's just this way of thinking where it's an ideology and you can't step outside of it and that group think versus being able to integrate different components. So you can say, yes, I, I like, for instance, not to toot my own horn here, but I, I was for a long time in a particular group think where, no, you should never cut a tree anywhere, more or less. And then I'm still pro wilderness. I, if anything, I'm, I'm more pro wilderness. I still think that there should be entire areas set off, but at the same time, I don't just shy away from the idea of, okay, well, how do we produce some of the legitimate products? We've got to reduce what we use and and not have as much waste, but we still have to do it. Somebody has to do it. So I would rather the people who are doing this are the people who actually care about the natural world and have that sort of conscience. So we do have to step outside, I would say, of our bubble, us pro-wilderness people and say, you know what, what Craig's doing there, as long as it doesn't encroach into our version of things here, is is a legitimate thing to not only not oppose, but I would say to support. So I personally think that there needs to be more exploration in this. And I do think it's that challenging of the group think absolutely time and time again. And I think listeners of the Green Root podcast, I gain listeners and then I lose them because they think that I am just a hundred percent lockstep in a certain way of thinking. And then and then I say one thing that I'm like, well, you know what, I'm, I'm actually, I, I would say that I, I see some impacts in terms of renewable energy resources and we shouldn't do biomass. They're like, yeah, but I think some solar is okay. And they're like, what? I will never listen to you again. It's like, well, sorry, I support some solar. I, I think we should look at the impact and I don't think we should delude ourselves into not reducing energy, but that's a whole other conversation. But it is this group think and I experience it over and over again. And I've been a part of it myself and the way I got out of it, I mean, I fall into it all the time and I'm sure there's aspects I don't even see, but the, the trick I found is if there is an idea that starts encroaching and it makes you uncomfortable and you want to push it away, you do the opposite. You bring it towards you and you look at it. 
That's that's the Jungian concept of looking at the shadow. The shadow, exactly. You yep. know, and that's and that's where the richness is, because whatever we resist the most has the greatest lessons for us at the same time. That is very wise, and I agree, and that's definitely where my explorations have got me into, stuff around the shadow. And so we also project all this other stuff onto other people that's actually inside of us. So who would think that is psychology relevant to forest protection? And the answer is absolutely it is. Exactly. But I, I would I would challenge, the, you know, the the extreme environmentalists or the people who are talking about wilderness, total hands off to to consider this thought. You know, what if into the wilderness there were um, very primitive, uh, you know, shelters that that people could go on vision quests for or, you know, what if. You know, we really did um, sensitively um, improve, you know, trails and, and vistas. And because, you know, as they say, you know, the, in, pre, in the wilderness is the pre preservation of the world. And people need to experience it, not over experience it, certainly. But, you know, is it possible, for example, that that we might, you know, with some wisdom, um, do some things that could encourage deeper thought, uh, that could encourage silence, that it could encourage, you know, vision quests, you know, that could encourage people returning to their soul rather than their cell phone. Yeah, I think there's, I think there's a lot of truth in that and so long as there are areas i think that we we leave alone and don't overuse because there are issues particularly out here in colorado where i'm living and definitely in oregon where we do over recreate so i think as yeah. long as there are things put in place like that it's it's obvious that what we need to do is we have to get people more in touch with the natural world for them to care about it right for them to get to that point where they can appreciate it they have to experience it so yep. I don't really know any wilderness folks who would be against more folks just going in the woods. And there are shelters in all sorts of forest areas and, and things like that. So I think that is a, a very different use of it compared to an industrial extraction version of it. So I, I think that would be a more reasonable thing, whether whether that's in official wilderness or if it's in other areas. Maybe it's like some of the areas that are restored can start being utilized as that and over time they return who knows there, there's lots of room for discussion on that but the idea of getting folks back into the woods whether it is through ccc and so doing all sorts of work and restoration on degraded areas or, and road removal or if it's the idea of vision quests and getting people into the forest to really connect to the to the land that way i think that's that's very very positive and i do think that pretty much all, maybe not all, but the vast majority of wilderness supporters would be in support of that concept. And I think that, that in terms of the industrial paradigm, that it is nothing short of a crime against humanity. And I think we need to, to frame it in that way, that, that the industrial model is in fact exacerbating climate change and the negative aspects of future generations in spades in more ways than we can even than we even know at this point for sure you know that's the thing to me is that how do we how do we successfully challenge the industrial paradigm as truly being a crime against humanity yeah while at the same time offering alternative ways because that exactly. that is not typically what the activist mentality does and I speak from being an activist for a long time and it's always been about pointing out what we don't like which you have to do that's the first step and a lot of times we pretend that things aren't happening that are really happening so we have to do that and then we look at things another way and I think we got into some of that on this podcast and I think 
I think some of this is going to be challenging to some of the people who are listening, but that's what I want to do with the podcast. I don't want to just tell people the same things that they already hearing the echo chamber. I want to challenge myself and my thinking and evolving that. And we don't all have to agree on everything to to be moving forward in a similar direction. And I think that's a failure of a lot of, let's just say, leftist movements where it's like, oh, you don't do this exact thing the way I want it. Then not only are you not on my team, but you're evil and I'm going to destroy you. And that is one of the biggest failures. You, you can say to somebody, oh, yeah, there, there you go again. You're, you're trying to do this thing. I don't really like that, but here's this thing. We can still have communications. We can still move forward. And sometimes we can convince other people, or if we always do disagree on a few things, so what? Good. I I disagree with everyone on something. I have never met a person where I agree 100%. And if you're listening and you think that all the people that are around you agree with you 100%, the problem, they probably don't. They probably actually are just keeping certain things silent or they've just, you've never come up with that issue or they are just so much in groupthink that they've literally been brainwashed and are not thinking for themselves. So it's good to think for yourself. It's good to think outside of the, the box or however you want to put it. And these are the discussions we need to have. And I don't know if we, we saved the world with this, but I think this is... A very important discussion, and I want to have more of these on the Green Room podcast. So I'm really glad that you could come on, Craig. It's it's been wonderful, Josh, and I really appreciate your openness and your questions. I I would add that again. I think you know understanding our shadows and understanding where we get things that that are dysfunctional is important. And I would suggest that. You know, what you were just talking about with, you know, the all or nothing or the win-lose mentality is part and parcel to our problems. And if we held, for example, integration and synthesis as the target, as the goal, or as Sri Aurobindo says, consciousness is the key, consciousness is the means, consciousness is the end. And if we can understand it from those bigger frameworks and recognize that we all have a piece of it, but how do we integrate and synthesize into a, into a bigger knowing? And then I think um, our communication, hopefully, is, is more open. Not always, by any means, but hopefully. Yeah, I think that is the root of all roots. So I think we just found it. So that means I don't need to have any more of the Green Root podcast because we figured yes, out the do. root. <laughs> we yes, figured the do. root out. No. <laughs> but no, but I, I think you're absolutely right. It is that consciousness. And that is what I'm coming to time and time again. And I totally agree with what you're saying. That's got to be at the heart of what we're doing in order to be able to clearly see where we came from, where we are right now and where we're going. So thanks again, Craig. Exactly. Well, thank you, Josh. I really appreciate this, and I I hope it will stimulate some thinking. I think it will. All right. You take care. You too. Bye-bye.